I hope you rested well and you're ready to take on the world. Yeah. So PowerPoint is an excellent vehicle for keeping a speaker on track and for giving the listener something to visually aid what's being said and to take away after to reflect on. But the limitation of PowerPoint is that sometimes you think of things that you really want to say after the slides are already made uh, and things that you need to say that you forget to say in the middle of just following the text of a slide. So what I thought I'd do before I start forcing myself to tend the project of the slides, I'd actually just say a little bit of context to you about what this topic means to me and where it comes from in terms of the story of my own theological development. <clears throat> so it was almost 35 years ago that Jay and Andrew and I were at seminary together <clears throat> in the 80s. And even then, <laughs> yeah, a baby, he was, he was the baby of the class, yeah. Um, even then, we were being educated to understand that the world was changing, that the church that we had grown up in was becoming a different thing. But in that era, there was still a sense that if we could figure it out and get it right and make a new thing, we could recover some of the old, or at least, at least an homage to the old in a way that we would recognize. One of the jobs that I've had as a historian over these last 30 years is to write about our church and to track the statistics of decline. Now, there is nothing more life-sucking than that, to look at the statistics and the economics of what decline looks like. But at the heart of me, I'm not a historian. I'm a person of faith. I'm a cradle Anglican. I love our church. And I, along with everybody else, have been sure that if we could just get the formula right, we could turn the tide, we could make a different thing. But I think at the end of that last 35 years story of journeying with this, I've come to the realization that there is no turning the tide. There is no return. There is no looking back pillar of salt and all of that. There is only looking forward. So then became my question, what does it mean to look forward? I mean, what is God trying to tell us with the fact that this unrelenting curve of decline is washing over us over these many decades? Well, I've come to settle in my own mind what I think it means. And what I'm trying to communicate to you today is what I think it means. Now, when people hear me say what I think it means, they hear all different kinds of things. So what I thought I'd do before I start taking you through my slides about what I think it means for us in terms of the project of stewarding the gospel of Jesus for this generation, I want to say clearly what I am not trying to say. You will hear me say in this presentation, go to the world, go to the world, go to the world. God so loved the world. When people hear me say that, they raise a question. Well, what are you saying? We're supposed to be a humanist organization, a secular organization, just doing good like all the other organizations. What I want to say is that that isn't what I'm saying. So if you're feeling yourself feeling that in response to what I'm saying, wave your hand, pause and ask, or stop yourself from hearing that way, because this is what I think. I think that any work which is life-making and contributes to the well-being of the creation that God made and loves is a good thing. Whether it comes from the Christian church or any other place in society, secular, humanist, other religious group, whatever helps mend this world must be favorable to the intention of God. But what I do think is that the Christians have a very very, very solo, unique piece of the story about how that happens. One of my projects in the last 30 years has been looking at intellectual, philosophical, and religious thought systems around the world. And do you know that the Christian thought world is unique in one very particular, distinct way? It doesn't exist anywhere else in any other thought world or religious system. And it is the idea of forgiveness, but not just forgiveness, but free forgiveness. Many world philosophical views don't have an idea of forgiveness at all. We've all got responsibility, balance, justice, accountability. We've got all that. But the idea of mercy mediated through forgiveness that we didn't have to earn is absolutely unique to us. So then that actually gives us, thinking of our reconciliation motif from yesterday, very unique eyes to see the world. 
It means that the person that's causing harm in our eyes, the person that's on the outside, they don't have to find their way back in to welcome because it's already happened. And they don't have to pay any price just the way we don't. So because Andrew and Jay are here, I want to tell an old story from many years ago, from our time together at Huron College, that sets the frame for me in terms of what I think God is about, in terms of how God is reading the text of everything. We were in about our second year, I think, Jay and I, that meant Andrew was a year behind us, I guess, first year. And we were searching for a new faculty person. And as the young um, uh, person of, of enthusiasm that um, I was, wait, I'm getting my decades wrong. Was Jago the principal? Jago was the principal when we were students, wasn't he? Or no? For part of it. Okay, well, I may, this may be slightly after. Maybe I, I spent my whole life at Huron College, so I went back to teach very soon after I left as a student. So either it was in our era or it was immediately after, because Chuck Jago was, was the principal, and he knows I tell this story, so, he, so he, I have his permission to share it. So I never tell a story that I have not asked for permission for the protagonist to tell. So he and I got into a conflict as part of this search committee process because I really thought we should have women faculty and we had women on the search committee uh, uh, and we had a couple of names we wanted. Well, the principal made the decision that we would only interview one person who was uh, a male candidate. Well, I was furious. I started a boycott, you know, fighting the man how I like to do in those days in my feminista ways and started a protest and nobody would participate in the search. And, and, and then I went to Eucharist and sat down happily, waiting for the Eucharist to begin. Now the Huron College Chapel has monastic style seating. So you have to look at the people that you're at Eucharist with. I sat down. Guess who came in and sat opposite me, right opposite me? The principal. The principal who had caused this harm. He had no right to be here. Who did he think he was after the harm that he had caused? Coming to have Eucharist just like that along with all the rest of us. I was really outraged. And then in the middle of my arrogance and my self-righteousness, God spoke. And the whole chapel was flooded with the most amazing golden light. And I heard God say, he's my child too. I love him too. Well, every fractured place was healed in that golden light in that moment. And I saw then and I see now that absolutely every creature that God ever made, from Hitler to Attila the Hun to me, is absolutely beloved as a child of God. If God has announced forgiveness from the cross, who am I to second guess it? So that is what I know and believe, that we have something absolutely unique that we can offer in how we enflesh our actions towards the well-being of the world, and that that is where God is calling us to go. Okay. So now to the slides, uh, and if you're hearing something other than that, you can stop me or comment or hear it differently, whatever you like. So I want us to start with the gospel passage from John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's where I think our stewardship orientation and posture toward the world must begin. God loves the world. The Christians love the world. So I had a very interesting development fundraising related story to share with you on this very point in terms of the intention of God. Some of you from the Diocese of Huron may remember Bill and Kathy White. Do you remember Bill and Kathy White? No very good lay people who held up a lot of the refugee work of the diocese for many, many years. So here I was, going back in the day, a new teacher at Huron College, and the students there were amazing, weren't they, Kim? They were amazing. They were so full of energy for making the new day, for setting the world on fire and doing the right thing and being the best darn priests they could be, and they cared about the world. Well, there were a group of students who had a passion about poverty among children. 
in our diocese and in our cities. So they said to me, could we do this as our project for whatever class it was at the time? I said, yeah, that'd be great. So we had this, this group that planned this huge event. We were going to educate and raise money for child poverty in the Diocese of Huron. We were going to be the vanguard of, of a new day for helping the children come up. We were going to do it. There were six students. That's a lot of students. We were not big classes. It was a lot of students. They believed in it. We worked all term. It was the end of November, and the big day came. It was our day that we had opened. We'd thrown open the doors wide to the diocese. Everybody, come. We'll have the lunch. We'll have the education. We'll uh, solicit donations. And then some ambassadors back to parishes for more donations. And, and we so, if anyone ever believed in what we were doing, it was that group. So we were so certain. We were so certain of a flood, we didn't even ask for RSVPs because we didn't want to have to turn people away. So we did, they opened the doors. So we opened the doors that Saturday morning and a paratransit van drove up and dropped off uh, a young man who was quadriplegic who couldn't speak and, and left him there. Well, he spent the day with us. We found out later that paratransit had dropped him off at the wrong St. Michael's Church. <laughs> he was supposed to be at a program at St. Michael's Catholic Church down the road. But he was there with us for the day. And, and then in came Bill and Kathy White. We were excited to see them. We put their name tags on. Oh, get, have a coffee. The crowds never came. Nobody else came. That was who came. And we sat in circle and we were so distressed, our energy so drained. We, had, we were going to change the world through this effort we believed in that we couldn't even start. None of us could start. And I thought we needed to ex address our discouragement before we started the program. And Bill spoke and he said, do you mind if I tell you a story? So it's a two-sided story because you have to see the discouragement before you see the bill. So he told us a story, and he talked about being a young man in the 1960s who had a vocation to be a teacher. He was a teacher his whole life. He believed with his whole heart that God was calling him to be a teacher. He wanted that since he was a little boy. He went to school. He prepared. He was going to be a great teacher. He graduated from teacher's college, and there were no teaching jobs in Ontario. The only teaching jobs there were were across the border in Detroit. <laughs> Well, any of you that remembers Detroit of the 1960s remember that those were the burning years. The inner downtown, the inner city was a, a burnt out shell, violence and conflict everywhere. The middle class had long ago moved out. Well, that's where the job was. Well, he decided God wanted him to be a teacher. That must be where God was calling him, so he went. And he had a horrific time. He was lonely, he experienced violence in his classrooms, he couldn't teach, he couldn't control the kids, he was isolated, and he became angry with God. What have you done? I followed you and look where you brought me. One day at the end of uh, an afternoon class, a young woman, one of the students, approached Mr. White and said, Mr. White, I, I don't know if you're interested, but we have, a, we have a community church that meets on Wednesday nights just, just down the way in that old Episcopalian church down there. You can see it out of the window. Um, we meet, we have supper, and we pray, and we do Bible study. Maybe you'd like to join us. So he decided he would, and he went, and he joined this small black community which gathered in a place where the Episcopalians used to be when the neighborhood was good. And he started to come back to life. His heart started to heal. There was love. There was laughter. He felt welcome, some community, and, and his, his, his spirit went up again. Then one day, while he was teaching in his classroom, someone came by and banged on the door, threw it open, a student saying, they're burning the church, they're burning the church. And he ran to the window and he saw it. The church, the place of his peace and healing, was going up in flames down the road. His heart fell like a stone to the bottom of him, hard and angry. He finished teaching his classes that day. And when the school day was over, his heart growing harder by the minute, as he tells the story, he made his way down the street to the church, now a burnt out shell, which was still smoldering, but no longer flaming. He was so angry. But when he arrived, he saw that members of that Wednesday night group had arrived there before him. And someone had brought a bed sheet from home and magic markers. And on that bed sheet, they had written, go into all the world and proclaim the good news. And they were hanging the bed sheet on the smoking portals of the burnt out church. So Bill says to us, there's a world out there waiting. We're here. It's enough. That is the frame 
for me, that articulates the stewardship project for our generation. Our, our buildings aren't there in the way they were, but the world is waiting, and you and I, we're here. It's enough. So then, from that, my point, the gospel implies, I believe, a kinship with the rest of God's creation that summons us to go and live and work there. Ubuntu. Do you know how many of you have heard the concept of Ubuntu? Yeah. It's a South African concept. Desmond Tutu uh, is the one that introduced it broadly in the Anglican community. And it's basically this notion. It says that Ubuntu is really what it's about in terms of our being human. And it means that we can't be human beings in isolation. We can't exist alone. We're not separate. We are interconnected. My pain affects you, and your pain and joy affects me. And that is true not only for the body of Christ, but for all the kinship of the creatures God made. That's what Ubuntu means. So what we do affects the world. I have one interesting story about this, which is, seems like a trite story, but, but it, it isn't um, for me. So you see, I have a problem here, and when I go and I have to do a presentation, I'm very sensitive that it doesn't look proper, it's not nice and organized. I had to go to a peace conference in Seoul, Korea, and I was talking about peace and reconciliation uh, among Canadian Indigenous peoples in the aftermath of colonization. And I was up the next morning to uh, give this presentation early. And horror of horrors, my curling iron didn't work. I discovered the day before. I thought, what am I going to do? How will I present my hair? Now today, many years, I would just pull it into a ponytail and give the presentation. But someone said, oh, there was another Canadian there, another Canadian Anglican. I won't say more than that. She has a curling iron with her. Why don't you go ask? So I went and I asked the other Canadian Anglican woman, oh, I'm in a bit of a desperate situation. Would you mind if I came to your room early tomorrow morning, picked up the curling iron and prepared my hair before this presentation? And she said, well, no, that would be very inconvenient. I'm not getting up early just so you can do your hair. <laughs> I said, OK. And I took my tray. We'd been in the lunch line. I took my tray, and I went and sat with a group of strangers that I'd never seen before. And it turned out they were a group of women from South Africa, in South African Anglican Church, actually. And they said, what's wrong, sister? You, what's wrong? You look like, has something terrible happened? And, and I told the story about the curling iron. Well, it was amazing. That group of five women said, well, so-and-so, you have a curling iron, but yes, she was over in the other compound, not near where the Anglicans were, and over here. They were in three minutes. They worked a plan for this curling iron to go where it needed to go through the group and to me, so I didn't even have to leave my room early in the morning because they said, you've got to speak, sister. Let us do this for you. We want all your energy to go into speaking a good word. <laughs> and I said to them, whoa, you guys are nice. <laughs> and, and one of them said, well, that's Ubuntu. Ha, huh. that's Ubuntu. Wow, that they would care about the hair on my head, as God does. So that is where I believe we're called. We cannot define our stewardship mission first as to how we're going to survive as a church, how we're going to do our work, even though that is very sacred and important and we need to nourish each other. But somehow, the question about what God needs of us in the world I think, is actually a prior question for us. OK, so our suffering is interconnected. I've got one other story here, because it's a good Anglican story, too, and it's a very meaningful one. And I want to connect the world's suffering with ours. I'll share this story as well, uh, keeping my eye on the time. Uh, so I was in a meeting <laughs> in the mid-'90s. And we were all then, we leaders of the church, fully aware of the decline and what are we going to do, and still trying to stem the tide. So we're at this national church meeting. It was theological education, of course. That's the meeting I was usually in. And we're talking about what different places were doing to try and stem the tide of decline. There was this little tykes nursery, and there was this new parking lot, and there was if we promote this way, if we advertise this way, if we use this technology. Everybody had lots of ideas about how we were going to rebuild how we were going to stop the tide. And into the middle of that, the one First Nations woman who was there in the meeting spoke very quietly into the middle of the circle. And she said, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You're talking about how to grow the church. 
when in my communities we're talking about how we're going to heal from our history. And I realized in that moment that all of our communities are a part of that conversation. The healing from our history is not only for the First Nations community, of course, it maybe even is first and foremost for all of our communities. So the questions we ask determine the answers we find. So in this stewardship conversation, what question are we asking as the first question? And how then will that define what we're going to see about where we can go? So we know the church is struggling. Uh, we know that we're declining. And that's a very real thing. We can be paralyzed by despair. We talked about this yesterday. I won't redo that one. But we know it can be paralyzing. But the truth of the matter is, I believe that the struggles of the church and the world are linked. And that is the stewardship point that we're going to have a look here. I'm going to introduce us to three, three theologians from the 20th century. People that were flags for us. They were like beacons in the fog saying, over here, church, over here, come this way. And they are all people that talk about the necessary interrelationship between the well-being of the world and the well-being of the church. In other words, they believe there is no church that is not committed to the well-being of the world and that there is no well-being for the church without tending the project of the well-being of the world. So then we have our dilemma. I, ha I think personally there are two primary dilemmas for us in terms of stewardship right now. The biggest of them may be communication. What do I mean by that? Well, we're out there, here I am talking, and you're listening and you're understanding me. Like the, the words I'm putting in your ears are dropping someplace inside of you where they can be recognized. But if I were to go out on the street and say these same words in different contexts, statistics would show that my words would not fall inside in a place that people would receive and recognize them. And so for us, the challenge is going to be, as a stewardship project, how do we communicate? Because we have this gospel that we know is not like any other, that holds a piece of this mending the world puzzle that no one else is holding. But if we can't communicate it in a way the world can receive it, we are lost. So here's the basic missiological theory here. We have to find a meeting place between the experience of the world and the gospel of the church where something is recognizable, where we can communicate in a way that when the meaning is communicated, it will fall inside others in a way that they can receive and hold. I've just put this slide because I kind of like it. I think it's kind of cute. The second challenge for us is our concerns for survival. Our concerns for survival, not everywhere. The big churches, the ones with endowments, some people are doing okay, but we know that most people are not doing okay. Uh, and we are preoccupied by that. And basic spiritual wisdom of the church is as long as we are preoccupied by our, with ourselves, with our distractions, then we're not going to be able to tend this project of finding that meeting place where the hurt of the world can meet the healing of the gospel in a way that will affect the reconciliation that God intends. I, okay, one little story. I, I know how long I have, so I promise I won't take too long, but this is a really, is a, is a really striking story from uh, now, uh, quite a while ago, 17 years ago. I arrived in Vancouver. Now, in Ontario, there still is the church. There still is the church. It's different than it used to be, but it's still here. But when you go to Vancouver, even 17 years ago, uh, the church there has been on the edge of almost gone for so long. And I showed up to preach one Sunday at a church in New Westminster, and the, the priest was, I still hadn't realized how different it was. It was still new. I was still expecting there to be a church to preach to. Um, and the priest proudly showed me around his church. He took me down to the downstairs, and there was this little Sunday school. It was so beautiful. There were books and the toys and little wooden furniture. It looked very dated. I mean, it looked old, but it was clean, and it was lovely, very inviting space. And I said, oh, that's great, because I already knew enough to know that children were a problem in terms of where are the children in the church. I said to him, so you have children here. That's awesome. And he said, oh, no. We haven't seen a child here in this church for 20 years, but we keep this ready just in case one comes. Okay, so we know that there is a world of hurting children out there, and there is a place sitting right ready for them to be welcome and loved and play. How are we going to communicate that that space is there in a way that will make a place for them to participate in the welcome we intend? 
Okay, so Bonhoeffer, I just have to tell you, he's, he's been the key for me in terms of trying to understand this. So I'm a theologian. I love the theology of the 20th century. I'm not going to give you a big, long lecture about Bonhoeffer, uh, Bonhoeffer but I, I do want to bring his insight into the middle of us because I think he gives us the language. I think he articulates for us the meeting place in terms of that middle place in the bubble where the world and we can find a way to pass our meaning across to each other. So I don't know if you know much about Bonhoeffer, but I'll just tell you a little tiny bit about him and his story. So he died a young man uh, in 1945, April 1945, just before the end of the Second World War. He was executed by the National Socialists for his involvement in um, uh, the resistance movement. He was a Lutheran pastor who had uh, been educated in Germany, doctor of theology. He had spent time with the Anglican community of the resurrection at Murfield uh, and had been totally inspired there with an Anglican vision of monastic life for ordinary people. He had spent time at Union Seminary in the US where he saw the social activism of the black church and theological community. So all those things affected him. And he went back home and he became very uh, upset. You know in Germany there was a confessing church. It was a church that decided to write the Barman Declaration. The clergy got together, a very few courageous select cl clergy, and said, no, Jesus Christ is Lord, Hitler is not Lord, because the National Socialists wanted Hitler to be the top of the church. Okay, that's enough history lesson. The interesting point is it wasn't enough for him, because he said, what does it mean for us to say Jesus is Lord when they are carting our neighbors off to God knows what end. And so he was frustrated with his colleagues that they weren't doing enough. He was arrested, he was imprisoned for about two years prior to his death. But while he was in prison, he wrote all this stuff about what it all, all it means and what is the church anyway and what is God calling of us and, and how can we make sense of it. And so you'll see in his writing, gathered in the letters and papers from prison from that era, he talks about his vision for what the church should be and what the church's relationship to the world and to power should be. And it's very, very moving material to read. And if you take it all apart, all those many writings, you can parse it into three basic wisdoms in terms of a frame for the church of the future, in terms of what it should be. The first thing he said, and this is the absolute hardest one, he says, the church needs to deconstruct its relationship with power beyond self-interest. He said that the history of Christianity has shown that so often we have been concerned with surviving, with growing, with our own place, with our own power, with our own status, our own traditions, that we have actually made our decisions based on self-interest and holding on to power, rather than taking the risk of releasing power and familiarity for the sake of the gospel. He's a very Christocentric person. So his basic idea is that the church should be Jesus in the world. Jesus didn't hold on to power. He gave away power. So the church should be doing the same thing. His, at the core of his thinking was this about the survival of the church. And this is old biblical wisdom writ through the centuries. Now in the middle of our conversation this morning, the one who seeks to save their life will lose it. And the one who loses their life for my sake shall gain it. That was his wisdom at the heart of the model of church that he develops. And it is, it is the wisdom that we know need to hold here today, I believe. So we deconstruct self-interest. We say, okay, we're going to follow all those spiritual disciplines we talked a bit about yesterday. And we're going to make choices that are faithful choices. We're going to let go of our need to look after ourselves. We're going to see something else. But if we're going to have the courage to do the hard thing, he had a really important piece of wisdom. And I don't want us to forget that. Because there are all kinds of people that take Bonhoeffer and say, he says, throw the church out. We don't need the church. That's not what he's saying. He's saying we don't need the church, but oh, the world has never needed the body of Christ more. And the way that the body of Christ is going to have the courage to be and say and do what God is calling us to be in the world is to stay faithful to the very traditions that have held us up for centuries. So he says, never has the time been more acute for us to pray together, for us to Eucharist together, for us to read scripture together. He says we don't need buildings and a lot of structure and paid folks to do that, but we need to be doing it. So he in fact imagines a world more like a monastic community where we don't just meet together once a week, but every day. And we shore each other up in the promise that we talked about yesterday so that we would have courage enough, trust enough in the overwhelming presence of the grace of God to risk living as though the gospel were true. 
So he says, then we got to practice the arcane disciplines. We got to pray. We got to be together. We have to encourage each other with our words and our actions and our love and our Eucharist like we never have before, because only there from that mystical communion will we have the wisdom and courage to do what God is asking of us out there in this broader world. But here, C is, is the hard part. He says that that middle piece, the missiological meeting place between us and the world, the gospel in the world for this generation, needs to be what he calls silent proselytization. What? Silent proselytization. He says, you don't need to go and say to the stranger, Jesus is Lord, come on to church. You need to go to the stranger, listen, see, and be Jesus as Lord into the space of need that exists there in the world. His theory was that only action, only action in this generation where the credibility of the church, and we know that to be true in our case now as well, pretty much all over the West for a whole variety of reasons, the credibility of the church to act uh, easily is very low. But he said, if we act, if we enflesh the meaning of Christ crucified with our neighbors, who is not compelled by that, we know that. We know that. A, a, a woman standing in line saying, oh, no, that would inconvenience me, teaches me one thing. A woman, a group of women racing all over a campus to respond to my need, teaches me an entirely other thing. So words, he said, really are not our forte. <laughs> Uh, and that finding other ways to communicate and to act in the world are what is going to be needed. Okay. So then, what is the church for Bonhoeffer? He summarizes it in the last thing he ever wrote. It's a little six-page six document called Outline for a Book. Uh, in it, he writes just before his execution about what he's going to write when he gets out of prison and what he'll write about when he has time. Uh, but in his last thoughts, then, he's very clear. The church is only the church when it's there for others. He summons the church to engagement with the world as participation in the tasks of the world, not, quote, by dominating, but by helping and serving. The church's word gains weight by example alone, and we as the church are called to be the broken body of Christ in the world, no matter what it costs us. And in his day, of course, that would have cost, as it did with him, the lives of the people that journeyed with him. But he would say, so what? You know, life is a precious thing. God knows that and God's holding it. So if we spend our lives for the sake of the gospel, then the resurrected life in all of its glory is, is the outcome. So he has a very, almost the keenness of a young man martyr, the way he writes. But his wisdom, I think, is not wrong. Okay, so our stewardship challenge then is, is to look beyond survival. And our first question needs to be, what does God require of us in this generation? And it's going to be big, and it's going to scare us half to death. Yesterday, in the rural church workshop, um, one of the leaders told a really important story. And I think this story is, I didn't ask permission to tell it, but it was public already, so I guess it's okay to tell it. Um, which is just the example of a, a, in their diocese of a young woman with a passion for wanting to work with young people with mental health concerns and bringing that desire uh, into the midst of the church and the church wanting to find a way uh, to help her actualize that vocation, but not being able to, and then her leaving to find a different way to follow her passion to heal in the world. And the speaker said we should have found a way to help her. I think we don't need to judge ourselves with shoulds, right? I mean, we do what we can. But the fact that you saw it, that's, that's the key, right? That's the key, that's the answer. Who is coming to you? What are you seeing? It's gonna ask us to actually imagine what it is God asks of us in ways we have not conceived of before. But I do know this relative to the stewardship project, if we risk our life, we will save it. The gospel community, the body of Christ, will rise up insofar as it listens and heeds the word of God, whatever that might be. And I don't know what it is in your community. I can only tend the project of what it is in mine. Okay. So then I put this one, because this is just the, the last scripture passage, and I won't read it all, but Romans 8 uh, 28, really, all things work together for good in them that love God and are called according to God's purpose. I believe that with everything I am. If we are trusting the best we can to follow the will of God, it's going to be okay, even though it probably won't look anything like what we hoped it would or thought it might. 
Okay, so we will be changed. I just want to say this. No, when God shows up, we are changed. There's no holding on to the old day. There just isn't. If God is in the midst, we will be changed. From the inside to the outside, we will be changed. Our hearts will be changed. Our lives will be changed. Our structures will be changed. They just will be. And so instead of fighting that, I assume we're all here because we're thinking, okay, I'm ready to jump off this cliff right into that because we don't know what's on the other side except God, of course. No place to fall except into the arms of everlasting mercy. Uh, so how will we recognize the will of God? Um, what I've picked here is a couple of, of, uh, of 20th century wise ones that I thought uh, could help us answer this question. Because you know, how do you know the will of God? You alone do not know the will of God. We tested in community know the will of God. So how do we help our communities to test? How do we know whether we were supposed to help that young woman with that work or not? How do we test it? So the two people I've picked for us are Evelyn Underhill, an Anglican theologian from the early 20th century, and Dorothy Day, a Roman Catholic theologian, also from the 20th century. Um, she, the, both of these are uh, hardworking mystics, you might say, that in the world and also uh, committed to, uh, to illumination. So as with Bonhoeffer, she believed that humanity, that's all of us, just by our fallen nature, are effectively uh, egocentric. So without the help or the illumination of Christ, what we see is our self first, what we need first. That's true for us as individuals and as organizations. She says self-interest smears the windows of humanity. Religion itself can smear the pain. So we put on our religion glasses, right? We put on our religion glasses, she says, and oh, we can't see. So we need to take off our religion glasses and put on our body of Christ glasses and see the world differently. Because seeing through the eyes of Christ, the eyes of God, the heart of God, gives us a very different read on the world and what's required of us. So the goal of the spiritual life, she says, is self-simplification. In other words, living beyond the illusion of multiplicity and complicated self-interest. In other words, <laughs> said more simply, it's not hard. God is love, God is forgiveness, God is life. It's that simple, live that, that's the vocation. So we have a lot of qualifications, and well, there's this, and there's that, and but he did this, and I need that, and well, what about this? But she would say, mm, all of that is illusion, and all of it is dross that needs to just be released, such that we can encounter with fresh eyes the intention of God beyond our own self-interest. So stewardship then, she says very clearly, is increasingly complicated in the modern era. Uh, she gives us that, and she argued that the movement toward living as though we understand that all life is as sacred is the way through the complication. So if we know that all life is sacred, the geese, all the humans, every child, the fish and the birds, she wasn't an environmentalist, but she did get that. If all life is sacred, everything that lives is holy and blessed and of God, everything, even the things that seem profane, because they are of God, because God made it. Then how do we treat it differently? It's like me and Jago in the chapel, oh, out of here. You know, Who am I to say, God made him, God made the fish, God made your enemy, and the one who has harmed you, God did. God made it, God knows it, God loves it. So says Julian of Norwich and Evelyn. So our only stewardship responsibility then is to ensure that our way of being in the world organizes around this knowing. So as we buy our groceries, as we convene our meetings, as we drive our vehicles, as we care for the children on our block and in our neighborhood, and the prisoner and the prisoners down the road, in the jails down the road, like all of it, as we make those choices, coming back to our choice motif, the only choice we need to make is for life in the name of the gospel. Uh, I have a good fundraising story from there in terms of a successful project, and which I'll just share because I, it's, a, it's a really interesting moment. Uh, it was a shocking moment for me, but a beautiful moment. So I have to work in India. I, I go around a lot of places, and one of the places we're working for Renison is with India right now. Um, have any of you been to India? Many have been. Some have been. So you know that life in India looks very different than it looks here. And one of the particular areas that we're working in, of course, is because I have a social work school at my, at my college, is with the social service agencies and projects, particularly with children, because children are on the very bottom of the bottom. Uh, the children of the underclasses are on the very bottom of the bottom in India. So I had gone up into the hills of the province of Tamil Nadu, 
And up in the hills of the province of Tamil Nadu, it's a pretty shockingly poor area. And the habit there with disabled children who are treated as animals, not um, people, has been, because families have to go and earn what living they can, that, that the habit in the hills, among the hill people, has been to um, tie children up inside the dwelling places and just leave them there all day while their families go off and find a way to make a living. So a group of Christians in that area from the Church of South India saw this and had this, like, these are human beings moment. And so even though they did not have money to pay their local pastor, they made the decision this, in this town in the hills of Tamil Nadu that they would take everything they had to try and put together a place and a center where these children could come and have a form of daycare and be welcomed and insofar as it was possible learn a trade. So they did that. The pastor was the first one to say, I don't need a job. I, I don't need a job earning money for this, but I want to stay and help, help you build this project. So he then started earning money working in a local shoe manufacturing uh, enterprise. And the team gathered, and everybody agreed that they would give everything extra. And this was a very poor community that they had. And then they reached out to the international community and got more help because they were witnesses in their own community asking for help. The international community responded. And now in this village in Tamil Nadu, they have this center where about 200 children uh, come every day. They are picked up by the volunteers of the system. It runs entirely on volunteers. And the man who was the priest now runs the center, but again, uh, not for a salary, but for food donations to try and keep himself together and lives there in the building. And I said to him, why do you do this? Like, why? He was a man who had actually been abroad and had a PhD. I said, why do you do this? Why are you doing with this your life? And he said, well, these, I'm a human being. And these children are human beings. And that's what the gospel says we are human together. And so he, he's given his life in that project. But it, it is possible when we set aside one set of glasses for another set to see what's in front of us in ways where all the needs can actually be realized in a way that's transformative. Okay, so then sh this is a quote from Evelyn on faith and stewardship. Faith is not a refuge from reality. It's a demand that we face reality. The true subject matter of religion is not our own souls or our institutions, but the eternal God and his whole mysterious purpose and our solemn responsibility to him through our stewardship of his intention, life for all. The Catholic worker movement, just to introduce you to Dorothy Day, I'll just say a little bit about it. It, it was a movement that was started. Uh, it's a pacifist movement as well, but it was really a movement that sent um, an invitation to create spaces of welcome for the poor all over the United States. We have some here in Canada as well. It was sparked by Roman Catholic lay people um, who wanted to take their faith very seriously. So a whole system of houses of hospitality is called Catholic worker houses were set in large urban areas starting in the early 20th century all, uh, all across North America. And the purpose behind this is that the poor should be treated as human beings. So the vision was not let's have a soup kitchen for the poor, but let's live with the poor as our brothers and sisters in a shared humanity. And so a whole movement started that has really changed the face of the urban poor in many, many areas of North America. And Dorothy um, was one of the co-founders of that. And so I just want to talk a little bit about her wisdom as illumination for how we view our context. The Catholic worker movement is what she did with her wisdom and her context. What will we do with ours? So she says, living now is the thing, that we need to begin with the sacrament of the present moment. She says, in each situation, in each encounter, and in every task is the path to God. Whether it is taking out the garbage, peeling the potatoes, anointing the dying, in every task is the pathway to God. It is by way of engagement. We do not need to become different people first. We heard that yesterday, didn't we? In our wisdom from the medieval era. We can start this moment to add to the balance of love in the world. And she says, that really is our only stewardship responsibility. It may mean feeding the poor, living with the poor. It may mean protesting. It may mean being kind to your neighbor. It may be mean, meaning sharing your decision-making processes in a different way. But she says, adding love to the balance of the world is what makes the gospel and the good news real in every generation. 
So she believes that Christian love needs to be the basis of any society. She wasn't a pluralist, she was a good Catholic. She had a fairly uh, exclusivist notion around religious belief, but she didn't allow that to exclude people from her table. So she wasn't conversionist, but this was her, her core belief. But her model is not wrong. What she means by this is the free forgiveness of God is the basis of the good society, if you will. So service and obedience are the path to radical liberation for all of us, <laughs> she believed and that the Christian pilgrimage is inextricably linked to the journey of the broader community. So what we do matters in the world. We think often it doesn't, but she says it does, because if we're not doing what we're called to do in the world, the world dies faster. Our internal transformation happens insofar as we are engaged also with the external. <coughs> we were talking about that yesterday in terms of the dialectic between the outer and the inner. Okay, so she says then stewardship of the gospel in the 20th century, which is when she lived, meant active faith, which means, so we've got active faith, active love, active devotion, not all the same thing. For her, she really thought she was not a good person. She did, she really, if you read her journal, she was always screwing up, she thought she was always so imperfect, she was so, she, she never did her love easily. So she said every day, every hour was a constant return to faith, an action, if you will, active faith, converting, turning around. You know conversion means to turn around, turn back to God, turn back to God. Uh, we got up, we screwed up, we turned back to God, we turned back to God over and over daily as a community and as individuals. She talked about active love. In other words, that love as a word doesn't mean much. Bring the curling iron, bring the soup, um, bring, bring the friendship. You bring the action and you find your way forward. So hospitality, uh, spiritual and corporal works of mercy daily, she said, is the only way to spiritual health. And active devotion, along with Bonhoeffer and all of them, know that you cannot do this. You can't live radical love without replenishing yourself in the font of the gospel. Uh, you bathe there daily. You renew yourself daily in the word and in the Eucharist. Okay, so then if stewardship is love enacted, what does it look like? Um, the face of an acted love, I've said here, will be particular to each of you. We know that. And it must be read against the needs of the moment, which means it will change week and month on. So the purpose of action then is communication. And that's what I just want us to take a little look at. If what we're looking for as stewards of the gospel is a way to communicate what is in us and what we know such that the, the deaf ear can hear, action then proposed through Bonhoeffer and my other two mentors is the way that our actions will, will communicate for us. And I've defined for us three types of action um, that that includes, in my view, for this generation. Uh, the first is political action, applied love in the public square, uh, non-cooperation with evil, Gandhi would say, insistence on truth. Uh, these, are, these are the stuff of, of actions which reflect uh, gospel in the political. Personal action, Bonhoeffer doesn't talk about this, but I personally think it's huge. It's absolutely huge. The personal kindnesses and actions to stand with the other in the middle of their suffering and need convert hearts in a way that, that is immediate and personal and maybe more powerful than anything else. Uh, and then aesthetic action, that's a big one I think for this generation. We're living in a time which is very visual. So aesthetic action, art in all of its forms, uh, whether it's popular culture and uh, visual art through uh, mass media or whether it's fine art or um, whether it's theater or poetry, this generation is attuned to the aesthetic and rather than saying, oh, the ascetic, why that's not bread, you know? Well, it is roses, and I think this generation, bread and roses both are the project for our, our leadership. I am just about out of time, but I have um, a story that I want to share as, as a way of ending. <clears throat> so, defining our work then. I want to say this, the way is not always clear. In fact, it's almost never clear. But there is a way. You cannot read the text of the story of the people of God and not entirely know that when the people come down low, there is always a way. And so whether we are down low or we are up high or whether we are in the middle somewhere unsure, God has a way that will open if we look and push even just a little. And that the work for us as we are trying to midwife this kingdom of God is to actually attune ourselves to the way that God is intending in each of us. 
Because each one, each one of you sitting here, a thousandfold, thousandfold actions of love and redemption will come from your choosing. Think, think of the multiplication effect of you with one act of love, not to mention the many that I know you have already committed and will commit in the rest of your days. So the trick then is for each of us to find as communities, our community and as individuals, what the way is that the unique hearing and giftedness of us is called or summoned to be in the world. My daughter Anna, again, story with permission, is now in her mid-twenties. When she was a younger woman, around the age of 12, she had many, many, many struggles. And she didn't fit anywhere in the world, and she was angry at the world. And what that meant, because she was the daughter of a single mother, was that I, I took her with me. I traveled for my work, so she would come with me. I would take her out of school, we would take the homework, and she would come on my work trips with me. Well, this one time when she was 12, we had to go to a meeting in Atlanta. And the deal we had was that she would come and sit through the meetings, do homework, read a book, and then we would do something enjoyable at the end of each day. So this one day, we decided what she had asked to do was to go to the Civil Rights Museum, the Martin Luther King Jr. Civil Rights Museum in Atlanta. It's an amazing museum, if you've seen it. So we went to the museum, and she was full of her usual anger and rage at the world, always, 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 just the anger. And we got to the museum, and we went through it. It's amazing technology, a lot of lights and displays and information and sound. It's like an amazing telling of the story of the civil rights movement. And then you come to the very last room in the museum. And you enter it, and it's dead quiet. The lights are on, but there's no sound, and everybody's standing in the room, just quiet. And you go in, and you see there's only one object in the room. In the center of the room is a Civil War era mule cart cordoned off with a red velvet rope. And you read the sign, and it says that the mule cart is the mule cart that carried Martin Luther King Jr. in his burial procession. And Anna and I just stood there looking at it, and she grabbed my hand like this. And she said, well, I suppose if God has a place in history for a mule cart, God must have a place for me. And that moment became a turning, a turning for her and for both of us towards seeing a way. So that is absolutely what I know, that there is a beautiful way for this generation and that the capacity that we have in each of us and in each of our communities to midwife the kingdom of God in ways that will change this world is infinite. All we need to be willing to do is take the risk of seeing and hearing and living newly. If we take the risk of losing it all, we will find it all, which of course is new life unending in the gospel of Jesus. Thank you very much.